After defeating Magus and returning to town, we see that it has been infected in the same way to the locked infected fields and wonder if the virus is spreading. We check the news and see that the creators of the game have been blaming hackers and Helba for users falling comatose and claim it's not a flaw in their system. We know that's not the case and acknowledge that even Leos wouldn't buy into that. Logging back into the game, we run into Mia by the gate. She is acting weirder than usual. She is slumped over. She sees us and talks in such a slow demeanor. She points out how there aren't many people logged into the game today. She comes to the conclusion that it must be because of a festival. Confused, we ask what she means. She then talks about how a barrier has been lifted, and all of the players are now all gone, and how we can all go back and forth freely now. We go out to reach for Mia to see if they are doing okay, and just about as we were to touch her, she shouts telling us not to touch her. She begins to tremble, then returns to her lax, slouched position, and she asks if we know where Elk is. She can't recall where he is, and believes that she left him behind again. We ask Mia if something is wrong, and point out that she isn't acting her usual self. Without answering, she logs out. Going back to the board, we find a post about a floating red wand. This couldn't possibly be the same red wand Scathe used, could it? The post has users who also saw the wand, but mentioned that there was a character with the wand, some twin blade user, a twin blade user who once fought against the Crimson Knights. We store the dungeon location and make our way to our mailbox. We receive a letter from Mistral. She requests that we meet her in the root town, and that she wants to talk. We also receive an email blast from the CC Corporation, blaming Helba for the damage to the world, and claim they have nullified the issue. Looking at the boards, we see that other players are now able to obtain virus cores. Someone points out to take them to Wise Man, and he'll pay a lot of money for that item. Going to town, we see Mistral's waiting for us near the gate. She seems nervous to speak. She says that she has been meaning to tell us for a while, but was unable to. We try to lighten the mood, and tell her she isn't acting like her usual bubbly self. She apologizes, and then tells us what has been on her mind. She says how she is a housewife, and she's going to have a baby soon, and that because of this, she can't do anything dangerous or scary that may cause her harm. She wanted to help us until the end, but no longer can. We congratulate her on becoming a mom. She tries to apologize again, but we understand and don't want her to get down on herself. She wishes us the best of luck in our hunt, and then we say our goodbyes and part ways. Heading back to the other town, we stand there contemplating when suddenly Black Rose appears and asks if we received the email from her. We tell her we haven't received it yet, and she brushes it off saying it wasn't really anything important. Kite questions everything they've accomplished and wonders if what they are doing is the right thing. Black Rose responds, saying it's sort of too late to be changing our minds now. She also reassures us that she is here for us and is here to listen. We mention how every time we jump into action, something awful happens. All the things Balmung believed we were may be true. Black Rose says that right now, there is no way to tell if what we are doing is bad or good. She gets frustrated with our attitude towards ourselves and tells us to cut it out, to try and remember why we are risking our lives in the first place, and that whining and moping isn't going to help. She then storms off and logs out. Heading to the boards, we see a message addressed to Orca. Someone mentions how Orca found a strange room on the Sigma server. We store the location and check our mail. We finally see the message Black Rose was trying to send us. It reads, Things are really hectic, but I'm sure they'll all turn out fine in the end. I can't contact anyone, but I think I'm okay. Call me anytime. Seeing this message before our encounter with her in town probably would have given us a more positive outlook. We also receive a message from the CC Corporation, informing players that the Sigma server is now open. Heading towards the Sigma server, we get an overview. It looks like an elevated city above a sandy current. It too has the markings of a virus infection. Exploring all of the Root Town servers, we will see fragments of characters from Dot Hack Sign, Mimiru, BT, Bear, Sora, Krim, Silver Knight, A20, Subaru, and Tsukasa. They all give lines from the anime before disappearing. We head to the field listed on the board where Orca was investigating. It's protected, so we hack the gate and make our way through. When entering the dungeon, we hear a voice calling out, saying, Humans have physical limits, but the AI has no limits to growth. I want to know where it will lead. I want to see what lies there. The ultimate AI makes mistakes just like humans. There is no growth without error. The difference is not to repeat the same mistake. Herald, this is a critical time. Earth is the womb of life and death, so the mother is both the goddess of life and death. Thus, maternity has two sides, life and death. So was her manifestation a necessity? Morgana, mode gone. She rejects my intervention. Making our way into the boss room, 
we see Balmung fighting against a data bug. He gets knocked back by the monster, and seems to be struggling to keep up with its relentless attacks. We shout at him, telling him to run. He seems too defeated at this point in the fight, and claims the monster is much too quick for him to run. We assist him in the fight and data drain the creature, and learn a new skill, 2128 Drain. Now in its weakened state, we are able to defeat it, allowing us to emerge the victor. We hound Balmung telling him that he is crazy attempting to fight the monster alone. He tells us he couldn't ignore the monster, and asks why we bothered to help him. After all he did to betray our trust last time we met, he also acknowledges that he scorned both myself and Black Rose, even though we were the ones who fought bravely against Magus. He feels guilt and cowardice after the event. Confused, we respond by asking why we shouldn't have helped. He understands and acknowledges that the power that we hold from the bracelet has blinded him with hatred, making him forget where his morality stands. The power the bracelet holds isn't the thing that is evil, but rather the intentions of the one who wields said unimaginable power. He now sees with unclouded eyes at his past selfish ways, and Kite recites what Aura once told him, a great force, the power it holds can bring forth either salvation or destruction. At the whim of the user. Balmung asks what we just said, and we tell him that it was the exact words Aura told us when she gave us the bracelet. Balmung sees us for who we really are, and believes we truly are the ones who should wear the bracelet. He then goes on to apologize for everything he has put us through. He vows to restore the world and wants to help Orca as well. He knows this task cannot be done alone, and requests that we lend him a hand. He knows what he says sounds selfish, and belittles himself. We assure him that we would never laugh at such a request, and also have a request for him to lend us a hand with, to help our friend Orca and to play the game the world that isn't corrupted. We too acknowledge that this isn't something that we can do alone, and request for him to lend us a hand. Balmung, almost speechless at our request for being so honest and open, agrees to help us no matter what. Balmung reaches for his sword, and we reach for our dagger, both of us raising our weapons in the air as a symbol to our agreement, and with that, we have received Balmung's member address. Balmung informs us that the reason he and Orca were investigating the rumor was not because they wanted to find the source, but rather to prove that it was only that a rumor. But then, one day, they discovered a strange room. It was a bizarre, unusual place. And then Orca said the words, Morgana, mode gone. The same words that we heard from the voice when we entered the dungeon. Orca said that he would explain all of the details later, but then that's when the incident happened with Aura and Scape. We walk into the next room, and are in another blank empty room. This one has a rug on the floor, scattered with butterflies on it, with a few to be in mid-flight. A single table appearing to have a glass of wine and books that looks as if it had been knocked into, but before anything can fall over, everything is almost frozen in time. And then a voice calls out, the whole cannot be changed. We have already lost that chance, because the time left to us was short. We were mistaken in our path, but now do we realize, we should change not the whole, but the parts. And then we receive the key item, Epitaph 02. We see underneath all of the butterflies, a single picture frame with a photo of a woman, partially covered with the butterfly's wing, almost to mask her identity. After logging out, we check our mail to see a message from Black Rose, asking if we are still up for the challenge we face ahead. She wants to talk at the Forbidden Holy Grounds. Making our way inside the Holy Grounds, we see Black Rose standing near the chained statue of Aura. Once approaching, Black Rose opens up to why she is risking her life. She mentions that she has a brother who fell unconscious. She tells us the reason why she hasn't said it before was because she couldn't find the right time to do so. She brings up that when we first met, she asked us to come here with her, because her brother fell unconscious in this exact area, and she wanted to see it for herself, with her own eyes, but was also too scared to go alone. Even now, she is still very scared. She tells us that she couldn't have gotten this far had it not been for us by her side. However, if we start to doubt ourselves, then who will be there to support her? How is she supposed to cope? How can she be happy? Knowing her brother is in the state that they are trapped in, she starts to tremble and cry. We now see the impact of our actions, not only on the world, but to those we care for. We go to comfort Black Rose. She tries to play it tough and denies crying. After all, we can't see her cry, so how would we know? We almost don't know what to say and pull away. She then shows face and tells us how we always clam up when we should be talking. We apologize and tell her that we were wrong in thinking that we were doing this fight all alone 
and trying to hold the weight of the world on our shoulders, with trying to help Orca and stop the disaster. Everyone is doing their part to stop this horrible mess and have everything return to normal. We ask ourselves what we can do about the situation now. The solution? To do what we think is right, since that is the only way to move forward. Black Rose agrees and says we'll do it. Together. Back to her normal self, she proclaims, her intuition is pretty good, which gives us a good smile. She tells us that she is going to log off and visit her brother in the hospital. She thanks us for meeting with her, and we also thank her for knocking some sense into us. On the board, a post titled, I'm Terajima Ryoko, has someone introducing themselves, asking for help in a dungeon. They are new and don't have the hang of the game down. We received mail from all of our friends. It seems they were all disconnected from the world and wanted to inform us of their return. We receive a message from Wise Man. He has gone over the information regarding the cursed wave and would like to meet in Sigma's root town. Nuke Usagimaru asks us for our help. He seems to be feeling burnt out and would like us to accompany him in a dungeon to fight a strong monster to get himself back into their right headspace. Gardenia just sends us a location without any context. Sanjudo also asks for our help to get a rare katana from a quiz dungeon. Every correct answer gets you closer to the treasure room. Lastly, Marlo also requests our help. He wants to look for a specific monster called Necrotic Eye, and checking the boards, it appears someone is also looking for the same monster, so they post the field location. Entering the root town, we meet up with Wise Man. He points out how if we're proceeding as written on the Epitaph of Twilight, that we only have five more signs before the wave. We need to defeat them, but Kubia still stands in our way, since it still has retreated. Kubia the Hidden One. Wise Man is unsure of what role it will play. What did Harold want to accomplish with the world modeled after the epitaph? He gives us a virus core, and then he proceeds to log out. We get mail from Wise Man. He assumes that the source of the infection is the cursed wave, and then our best chance against it is to run a jamming program in the area where the wave exists to prevent the spread. However, we will need Helba's help if we wish to achieve that goal. He gives us a direct keyword to the net slums, so we won't need to head all the way through the dungeon to reach it. Heading to the net slums, we meet back up with Tartarga, who has a message for us from Helba. It has a field location and requests that we come alone. Tatarga also has a request for us. Ever since that day Magus attacked, there has been a troublesome fellow living there. He asks if we can get rid of it. Getting to the back of the slums, we find a data bug. We data drain and defeat it. We then head to the location Helba requested, which has a data bug. So we data drain and defeat it. Helba appears and tells us how strong we've become. We ask if Helba was testing us. To which she replies, The success of the operation depends on you, but good work. She heard from Wise Man about the plan and believes his tactic might work. So she accepts his offer to help. Wise Man sends us a message. He confirms he receives consent from Helba, and according to her, there is an increasing amount of data in the field. He requests myself and Black Rose to head to the area. We also get a scrambled message from Aura that reads, Fidchel is going outside with my fragment. Please bring it back. Heading back to the root town, an unknown Heavy Axe user is waiting for us. This is Edajima. He was briefly shown with Sieg in .hack infection, and was also shown recently posting on the board asking where Sieg has been since he hasn't been online or replying to his messages. Sieg was put into a coma during .hack liminality part 1. Edajima has a virus core for us to use. He heard from Wise Man and is even rooting for us. We head to the dungeon that Terajima Ryoko requested help with. We see another player who came to the dungeon to help Terajima. Exploring further, we see yet another player. They saw someone staggering down towards the lowest level. Making it to the room Terajima is in, she asks where she is at in the dungeon. She got lost and needs help to get back to town. We help getting her back to town, and she is so thankful that she gives us her member address. Also, as a side note, I just want to point out that by herself, she made it to the lowest level of a level 54 dungeon at level 1, so big props to her. We also receive mail from Terajima. She mentions that there is a rare item in a dungeon, but feels like she'd get lost again, and asks for our guidance. Logging back in, we go to assist Nuke, who has been feeling burnt out and when reaching the boss room, he gets himself psyched up. After defeating it, he finally understands. Before, he would act like he was in dangerous situations against easy monsters, but without allowing himself to actually feel the pressure of a tough fight, he wasn't feeling accomplished. We sort of understand, after all, we've been risking our lives the entire time. 
Nuke thinks we wouldn't want to party with someone trying to risk their lives in combat, but ensures us that he won't go too crazy. After all, he's a showman over anything else. Next, we party with Gardenia. She asks us something pretty cryptic. She asks, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, what would you want to do? We tell her that we've had the thought before, but we won't really know until that time comes. We ask her if there's something wrong and why she's asking something like that in the first place. She says that she just wanted to ask, but she would want to lie down in a field of flowers and wait for her time to come. She would return to Mother Earth and nurture the flowers. Then, as if the thought was just too much, disregards it and wishes to proceed down the dungeon. We can't help but feel like there is something she isn't telling us. She brings up a question we had previously asked her about whether or not she liked flowers. She tells us that she didn't answer us then, but will tell us now, that the lifespan of a flower is extremely short, but in that brief moment in time, it lives with all of its might, and was about to continue before stopping. We definitely feel like Gardenia isn't acting right. Making it to the treasure room, Gardenia proclaims that it is now time, time to say our goodbyes. Shocked, we ask what she's talking about with goodbyes. We think of the worst and tell her that we can't say goodbye. She declines our defiance towards the goodbye and tells us that there is nothing we can do about it and to stop being selfish. We bring up that she's been talking about life and saying goodbye. She understands now and thinks that there has been a huge misunderstanding. She was referring to being busy with life and wouldn't be able to spend as much time online as she would like, much like a flower's life. We understand what she means now, but given the context, anyone else would have made the same conclusion. She doesn't believe so, but it doesn't really matter, and heads back to town. After Gardenia leaves, we are left wondering, why did we come to this area initially? Next, we head out with Sandro to help him through the quiz dungeon. The quiz master tells us that the answer to each question will be one of the three doors. Get the correct door, and move on to the next room. Fail, and return to the first. The quizzes aren't really quizzes, just common sayings like a blank earned is a blank saved, with north being money, west being love, and east being a penny. But answering all the questions leads us to the treasure room. Sandro requests the rare katana, and we gift it to him, and in return, he gives us the item Secret Reasons, which will increase our magical defense stat. After that, we help Marlo locate the monster Neurotic Eye. Reaching the field, Marlo questions if this is in fact the area the monster resides. We tell him that the boards informed us, and ask why he's looking for the monster, which he responds that he has his reasons. Reaching the room the monster is at, Marlo confirms that this is the monster that he is searching for. We help him defeat it, and after he tells us he once fought one a while back, he proclaims that he and others were no match for it, and before he knew it, he was alone. We ask if the others died during combat, and he tells us that they ran and abandoned him. It doesn't matter what the others say, everyone only looks after themselves, since it's all just a game after all. Marlo doesn't like to lose, so he's glad to finally be able to defeat it. We comfort him and tell him that perhaps his friends who abandoned him probably regret it. He doubts it, but we'll see about it. Suddenly two players appear. They call Marlo out by name. They saw the board post and knew they'd find him here. He brushes them off and tells them not to talk to him. Perhaps these are the friends he mentioned. One of them brings up the fact that the other day they freaked out and, but before he could finish, Marlo cuts him off and asks if they came all the way here just to tell him that. They apologize and acknowledge that what they did was wrong. Marlo is still upset and asks them if they think that this is an apology. He tells them that if they run away again, but before finishing his sentence, he knows he can't stay mad at his friends and tells them to forget about it. They ask Marlo if he will come with them next time, which he responds with, sure. We're happy that Marlo was able to make up with his friends, but he says, we'll see about that, before logging out. We head back to the area Helba informed us with a possible outbreak. We hack the gate and make our way to the field. We are able to make communications with Helba while in the field. She points out that it'll cause problems if Leos notices, so she'll only run the jammer right before we engage in combat. Making our way to the boss room, we encounter the fourth phase, Fidchil, the Prophet. Black Rose points out that this appearance resembles a mask. Helba begins launching the program. All communication with her will drop once jamming has completed. White noise on the screen will signal when to start combat. And once we see the signal, we rush in. Fitchell's movesets are Earthquake, Sleep, Slow, Oracle Hellfire, which gives all teammates fire vulnerability, Hellfire, which summons a fire tornado that unleashes raining fireballs onto a target and injuring the other party members, Oracle Thundercry, which gives all teammates lightning vulnerability, Thundercry, which strikes a target and injures the other party members, 
Oracle Ice Storm, giving all teammates ice vulnerability, and Ice Storm, which freezes all party members in ice that shatters, causing damage to each member. It can also use Data Drain, causing debuffs onto a single target of its choosing. When it has been weakened enough, you can use Data Drain on it, reducing it to its stone form. The stone form also has its own movesets. It will still use Earthquake, but can also cast Lightning onto a single target, cast Fire, which can KO Black Rose even with Fire Defense on, and can cast Ice, which can also KO Black Rose with ease. After the defeat, it begins to crack and crumble like all the times before. However, we begin to hear something. The words, like a frenzied horse that is driven, an unseen wind of plague shrieks across the border. Pandemonium, wailing, and stench of carnage fills the air. There is no place to run, no hope of escape. Those who are mourned will never return. The hands of time cannot be turned back. The clumps of rock ascend and disappear. We're left wondering what we were told is hinting at. Black Rose can't seem to understand it either, and fears that it may be something even worse. Back in town, it doesn't appear that the infection has spread. Perhaps isolating the fight is the key to stopping it. Reading the news, we see reports of phone lines going down, shutdowns for the stock exchange, and even public transit stopping. Perhaps this is what we were told, an unseen wind of plague that shrieks across the border. Back in town, we see Elk and Mia talking, Elk is giving Mia some aromatic grass. Shocked by the gift, she thanks him for the thoughtful gift. She appears to be acting more normal. Elk can't help but blush from Mia's kind words. Elk asks Mia what she's been up to since he hasn't seen her around lately. Mia claims to not remember, that her memory has been fuzzy lately. Elk is concerned and thinks Mia should go rest if they are feeling tired. We arrive in town. Elk sees us and waves hello, and we also say hello back. Mia turns around and asks, so who are you? Both Elk and I are surprised. Mia says she isn't being herself and decides to walk away and log out for the day. Elk notices how exhausted Mia is and mentions how she's been beginning to lose her memory and we begin to worry for Mia. Elk decides that maybe he should log off as well. We say our goodbyes and Elk logs off. We receive a message from Leos. He requests our presence in town at the weapon shop. Before meeting up with Leos, we assist Terajima in her hunt for a rare item. Making our way through the dungeon, we come across a monster and Terajima rushes in. We yell not to go in so recklessly, but without heeding our warning, she lunges at the monster, who effortlessly evades her attack. She attacks again without success, which leaves her wide open for the monster to attack. Frightened, she's frozen with fear, but before the attack can collide, we rush in and grab her just in time. We mention that the monster is too powerful for her at her current level. The monster again attacks. We put Terajima down, but we don't have enough time to also avoid the attack, resulting in us getting thrown all the way across the room, our body lying lifelessly on the floor. The monster redirects his attention towards Terajima. Again, Terajima is frozen with fear. And with this opportunity, the monster begins to reel its arm back, ready to strike, when suddenly its arm slowly lowers and its eyes go dim. It falls to the floor, and on its back is us with our dagger plunged into it, killing the monster. Standing up, we ask Terajima if she is alright. Terajima is distraught. She apologizes for not thinking and attacking carelessly. She begins to feel down about herself, calling herself useless how she messed everything up all the time, how even in a game, she causes problems for others. She keeps apologizing, asking for forgiveness, and we tell her if she truly feels that way, then all she needs to do is change, and we believe that she can do it, that everyone, including us, likes her a lot. She begins to thank us for our words. Back in town, we head towards the weapon shop and see Balmung is also here. He is arguing with Leos about what Leos asked him to do and what damage it caused. Leos deflects and claims that Balmung acted on his own free will. Leos notices us and yells that we're late. We argue with Leos that it wasn't free will, he used us. He brushes it off and says this is why he doesn't like kids, and says our interests were the same, which is why we joined forces, and that we followed orders out of our own free will. We can't believe the mental gymnastics that Leos is going through to not take responsibility. Leos goes on with why he asked us here. He believes an incubated virus has been found, and he would like us to investigate, but would like us to meet at the Chaos Gate. We don't give any feedback, which aggravates him. He asks for a response, which we respond with an over-enthusiastic yet sarcastic, Yes sir! As Balmung and I walk away, he says to himself what he said earlier, following orders out of your own free will, and then he scoffs. 
Balmung and I discuss at the gate that it is shameful that we are taking orders from someone like Leos. Sadly, we need information from Leos, and Leos needs us. It's a mutual agreement to help Orca and restore the world back to normal. Leos meets us at the gate and tells us he will accompany us this time. He also messaged Black Rose, but he said that she apparently doesn't like him, which honestly, I agree with her. Leos gives us the field name and also tells us it's protected and hands us a data core to use to unlock it. He will wait for our arrival at the field. Hacking the gate, we make our way to the field. Leos tells us that the infection of the field is at level 3, which is bad. And then Leos disappears. Entering the dungeon, we see Leos, who brings up that the infection of the dungeon far outweighs that of the field's infection. Leos says that he will go on ahead and wait for us. Making our way down, we see the data bug, and Leos confirms it. We drain and defeat the bug. Leos mentions that the rate of the infection is so severe that the field will be eaten away. Balmung asks about the field being eaten away. Leos responds with how viruses are incubating in monsters at such a rapid pace that it may be possible that the world itself will become a virus, and if that happens, there may be nothing more we can do but to destroy the servers in order to prevent any more spread of the virus. Balmung thinks the idea is absurd. We echo Balmung's statement and point out that if we do that, all the clues to curing the coma victims will be lost forever. Leos understands, and he brings it up because he understands all too well, but he also doesn't say what's really on his mind. He concludes that there is no use telling us about anything else. Our investigation is complete. He then proceeds to log out. We try to stop him, but it's too late. Making our way back to town, we run into Piros. His cheery attitude doesn't come at a good time. He tells us that he has great information, but only on the condition that we go with him. He eagerly awaits our response, and we tell him it's alright to go on without us. However, as if our words have fallen on deaf ears, he tells us that we want to hear this. The more the merrier, that two heads are better than one. We try to repeat that we have no interest in coming. He then proceeds to tell us that we must recite the secret spell three times at the lowest level of the dungeon, and then you get rare items. And then asking if we're coming with him, but without waiting for us to respond, makes the decision that we are coming with him, saying things like, that's the spirit, and let's strike while the iron's hot, even trying to rush us into going at this very moment. We say that it hasn't been decided yet, but also store the location in case we change our mind. But before we decide to help Piros, let's investigate something from earlier. The message about the red wand. The area is level 70, and with our current levels increased, we attempt to make our way through. We make it to the last room in the lowest part of the dungeon and see nothing. But as soon as we go to leave, we hear the noise that both Scathe and Kubia have used to traverse through the game. And there it is, the red wand. We can't believe it. It's actually still around, Scathe's wand. It begins to glow, and then suddenly, Sora from Dot Hack Sign appears. The last we saw of him was at the end of Dot Hack Sign, when he allowed Tsukasa to escape, and he was stranded and was data drained by Scathe. Perhaps his data was left behind within the wand? We say, thank you? As if we almost expected to hear it after releasing his trap consciousness. We also receive Sora's blades. We return to help Piros. We make it to the lowest part of the dungeon, and he confirms that we have reached the location. Piros repeats the magic words three times. After Piros is finished, we receive five items. Sticky helm, smelly armor, rotting hands, dog hat, and used disposable contacts. These do not sound like rare items that I would like to equip. Piros angrily requests that we give him those items. After all, he was the one who gave us the information, so he should rightfully have them. We are hesitant to hand them over since they are clearly not very good items, but he may get madder if we don't. He then starts to beg for the items, so we hand them over. He eagerly tells us that he will put them on right now. He puts them on and realizes he has been turned entirely orange again, just like every time before. He freaks out and the armor causes him to get debuffed, curse, sleep, confused, charmed, poison, and paralyzed. He busts out laughing, saying how all of these debuffs are a complete course. He points out how this is an unpredictable world. He exclaims, Live long and prosper! Let's meet again! And then he logs out. We receive a scrambled message from Aura. Deciphered, it reads, Speak with, please come to Sigma Town. I must tell you something. Logging in, we see Black Rose is also at the gate. 
She said that Bao Meng sent her mail asking to speak with her. We forgot to tell Black Rose that Bao Meng is one of our friends now. She can't believe it and starts to trash talk Bao Meng, calling him arrogant and a coward. But as she is talking about him, he appears at the gate. We see him and call out to him. Black Rose starts to say nice things about Bao Meng to cover up what she said before, calling him strong and saying how he's a descendant of Fianna, a title given to those who accomplished the goal of beating the One Sin event. Bao Meng knows what Black Rose is attempting to do, and apologizes to Black Rose for everything that he had previously done. Him apologizing throws Black Rose for a loop. She doesn't know how to act or respond. Interrupting our conversation is the noise. We recognize this feeling from before. It must be Aura. Black Rose doesn't seem to feel her presence and is wondering what we're talking about. We were able to hear Aura's words. She wants us to go to a field and she will be waiting there. Again, Black Rose is confused and is wondering who Aura is. We tell her that she is the one who gave us the bracelet and that we must hurry to the field. Bao Meng is also confused. But before we head out, we check the news and see an article about a disaster at Future Bay 21, which was the location of the second part of Liminality Yuki Aihara. However, the details are slightly different than what we saw. The details in the article mention that the audience in the theater were engulfed in flames after a failed fire alarm. However, in part two, we saw Yuki escape and even a fire alarm go off. In our mailbox, we again receive messages from all of our friends. Rachel wants us to mediate a trade. She wants to open up a courier service in the game and needs our help. We can even see on the boards that she is advertising the courier service. Moonstone is looking for treasure, an item known as Moon Knife in a dungeon. He doesn't say anything else, so I assume he wants us to join him. We help Rachel out with the courier service. We arrive in the dungeon and meet another player. We introduce ourselves and they give us the task to find a player named Akai and to give them the red sword and receive the item yellow cap. We run into Akai, but after giving him the red sword, he tells us that he already traded the yellow cap to another player named Aoyama. He thinks that if we explain the situation and give them the item blue boots, that they'll give it to us. They tell us that Aoyama should be at the bottom of the dungeon. We find Aoyama and give them the blue boots. He points out that we shouldn't ask for an item back after it's already been traded. Rachel asks Aoyama nicely to trade it back for us. He agrees and says only for this one time, and so we receive the item yellow cap. So we just need to reach the beginning of the dungeon to complete the order. We make our way back and give Kida the yellow cap, and we get paid. We ask Kida a question, that if they just asked Akai to come to their location, they wouldn't have needed a courier service. Kida sort of agrees, but also thought the idea of a courier was interesting and felt like using it. This surprises Rachel. She is really, really surprised by this news. Kita thanks us for our service and logs out. Rachel feels like she was just being toyed with the entire time. She logs out, attempting to try and chase after Kita for all the effort we were put through. Going to the board, Rachel unfortunately posts that she will be closing down the Rachel delivery service, saying that it was just too much work. Next, we help Moonstone get his rare weapon. Entering the dungeon, Moonstone repeats the objective. Got statue. Moon knife. Reaching the treasure, Moonstone mutters, Moon, knife, moon, moon. We chuckle a little and give Moonstone the moon knife. He asks if it's really okay to receive the weapon as a gift. We're friends after all, so we give the item that he was looking for. In return, he gives us Secret Divine, which will increase our physical attack accuracy. We head back and now it is time to help Aura. When making our way through, Leo appears without us noticing. He sees Aura and wonders if she is damaged data. One of Aura's fragments leaves us and returns back to Aura. Bao Meng questions what is happening, and Black Rose believes Aura is trying to say something. But before anything can happen, a tremor starts, and one of Kubia's roots abruptly shoots out from the floor towards Aura. Aura retreats, and the dungeon transforms to the stage Kubia had fought us once before. Leos looks around and sees Kubia for the first time. He is shocked by Kubia's appearance, how something like this exists within the world. Black Rose recognizes Kubia. Bao Meng, seeing it for the first time, wonders if we can defeat something so massive in size. We notice compared to the last time that Kubia has gotten bigger and that it's growing. The fight plays out exactly like last time. However, I don't know if it's because of the team, but I was going through Kubia phases quickly. Look how fast this phase is with menu screens edited out of the footage. 
The core goes between physical and magical tolerances while spawning Gamora. If you shift between phases fast enough, the Gamora will automatically disappear, so they don't cause any problems. Kubia will do the same attacks as last time. Legion's Reach, hitting all allies with its roots. Arc Bullet, which Kubia spits out energy blasts that hit each teammate. Megiddo Flame, which shoots fireballs out of Kubia's neck, hitting all allies. It does have a new attack though, called Jihad, summoning lightning from the sky to strike all allies. After its defeat, like before, it spews a purple smoke from its mouth and retreats into a portal. Leos is speechless and logs out. Black Rose mentions how the last time we saw Kubia was the last time we saw Aura, and perhaps Kubia is trying to stop us from meeting her. We wonder if it's trying to stop us. It might be a coincidence, but it always runs away, which is a detail we can't understand yet. What will happen if we do meet with Aura? Why is Kubia trying to stop us? Balmung asks what Kubia is, but we don't have an answer for him just yet. Back in town, we point out how Kubia is getting stronger, and how it's growing just like how we are growing stronger. How the infection is getting worse, and yet we are still not unified together to stop it. Black Rose doesn't understand what we mean. We mention Leos, that if Leos lends us a hand, and before finishing, Black Rose reminds us that Leos isn't someone that we can trust right now. We mention how Leos' goal is also to restore the world as well, and we're sure he'll lend us a hand. Balmung seconds our sentiments. Black Rose is still hesitant on Leos ever wanting to help us, but we reassure her that Leos will help us and do the right thing. However, his personality is a bit stubborn, so it won't be easy for him to agree to help us. Black Rose knows we need inside information from within CC Corp if we're to succeed, and Balmung knows that Leos and Helba aren't the type to work together. Thinking of getting everyone together as a goal is getting harder than expected. Black Rose seems to have a plan to get Leos and Helba in the same place together. She can get them both together, but wants us to handle the talking. Bal Mung wonders how Black Rose is going to accomplish getting them together. Without details, she only tells him, just watch. We wonder what we should do after we get them together. Then Black Rose logs out to send out her messages to Leos and Helba. We check our mail to see a message from Black Rose telling us to meet her in town and to look at the boards before coming. The boards have a message from Black Rose stating that we'll be waiting in paradise. This should hopefully get Helba and Leos' attention. We head back to town and meet with Black Rose. We question if Leos would come, but Black Rose assures us that they will both appear. We head to the net slums, and upon arrival, we are met with Leos, asking if we are planning to contact Helba. Leos isn't sure what we are planning, but he has already gone ahead and deleted the post from the boards. Leos is sure that Helba will not get our message. However, Black Rose believes Helba did see the message. Leos believes that the hackers are laughing at the idea of what has become of the world so far. Leos is curious what our intentions are in trying to work with the hackers. We ask Leos why he believes that the hackers aren't on our side. Is it Leos's corporate side that makes him believe that hackers are inherently evil? Leos doesn't understand, so we inform him that the problems affecting the world have no relation to Helba. Leos, unconvinced, believes that the power of the bracelet has gone to our heads. With or without the help of the bracelet, Leos is determined to restore the world himself. Leos is misunderstanding what we are trying to tell him. We simply tell him that we are all after the same results. Hackers, admins, and all us players need to work together. Again, Leos draws his line in the sand, saying he does not work with hackers. Black Rose points out how stubborn Leos is being. Helba arrives and backs us up in trying to convince Leos. Leos is surprised by Helba's arrival. He was so sure she wouldn't be able to see a deleted post, but Helba tells him that a deleted post is more of a sign of significance than anything else. She then hounds him that deleting messages with possible signs towards the truth is quite shameful, that given the current circumstance is a pretty bad move. Leos mentions that his silence doesn't give them permission to insult him. We see that verbal attacking him isn't the right thing to do. However, he needs to see us eye to eye and show us that he isn't being unreasonable, that the players who fell into comas from playing the game are still suffering, and what we collectively as a group should be doing is helping them. Leos agrees to help on one condition, that we obtain a virus core from the lowest level of a dungeon. 
We've done this countless times and Black Rose eagerly agrees. However, Leos wants us to not use Data Drain, which is our only way of obtaining virus cores from a monster, a near impossible task to complete. Black Rose calls out the ridiculous request, asking what we are to do if a data bug shows up. However, we agree to Leos' terms. Black Rose doesn't understand why we agreed to this term. We again make sure that Leos is true to his word, and that if we do it, he'll work with Helba. He agrees, but only if we follow the rules that he made. Helba knows how stubborn Leos is and wants us to show Leos our commitment to the cause. Black Rose thinks the situation is getting totally out of hand. Heading to the field, we see Leos waiting for us. He asks us again if we understand the conditions. We confirm that we understand and won't use Data Drain, but also that Leos understands that he must keep his promise if we do succeed. Leos scoffs, knowing that if we do succeed, he will have to put his pride aside. Making our way to the lowest part of the dungeon, we run run into a data bug. Black Rose can't think of a way for us to succeed and Leos, looming behind, wonders what we will do. And without hesitation, we charge at the monster. We fight the monster and unlike previous data bugs, the health bar is going down. After we defeat the data bug without data drain, Black Rose is shocked that we were able to defeat the monster. Leos asks us why we didn't use data drain. If we failed, we could have fallen into a coma. Black Rose pushes back and tells him that he's the one that made us fight the data bug. Why is he bringing it up like it's our fault? In the past, we fought monsters even stronger than this one, and Leos doesn't fully understand what we've gone through. We point out that Leos does know. After all, Leos was there when we fought Kubia. Leos is almost surprised that we noticed he was there, but changes the subject back to the data bug. He mentions that we did succeed in defeating the data bug, a fake data bug, that he himself created. If it had been a real data bug, the fight wouldn't have been so easy. We almost knew going into this it was going to be a fake data bug, but also understand that this game is very important to Leos. So Leos didn't wish to put us in actual harm's way. Black Rose wished we told her that in the beginning. Fighting a data bug without data drain almost gave her a heart attack. Suddenly, Helba arrives. She points out that Leos has lost this battle and must stick to his word. He acknowledges that he lost and having to push his pride aside isn't anything amusing. Helba decides to tell Leos of an internal farce within the CC Corp about how agencies that were sympathetic towards the company are preparing to announce that the company is responsible. And after finding out that information, the upper management is going out on a gamble for their own protection and are going to move forward with the physical destruction of the game's servers. Doing so will get rid of any clues to helping out those in comas. Leos is upset by this news. Helba adds that most likely they will blame hackers or terrorists are the ones responsible for the damage to the game and the coma victims. Even we are outraged by the news that the destruction of the servers won't do anything to help and how it won't stop the infection of the network. Helba knows the impact their decision will make, but also knows that they will proceed regardless. The company doesn't care about the infection on the network and that we'll need to do something before CC Corp does anything rash. We see how Leos is upset by this news and and again point out that we did as he instructed, but we won't force him to do anything he isn't comfortable with. However, now it seems he can put his ego aside and agrees to help out. Helba applauds our efforts and warns that from here on out, it's going to get busy. Black Rose and I both still agree to push forward. We go back and see a board post about a cursed area. A player mentions the missing programmer's curse, and another player posts the location. A message from Wiseman tells us that he is impressed that we were able to get Helba and Leos to work together, and points out part of the Epitaph of Twilight poem. And Helba, Queen of the Dark, has finally raised her army. Aperion, King of Light, beckons against the abominable wave. Together they fight. He points out that we still do not know the origin of the cursed wave, but with both Helba and Leos working together, we should be able to narrow it down. We head back to town and make our way to the cursed missing programmer's area. It's protected, so we hack the gate and make our way in. Upon reaching the lowest level, we encounter a data bug, and with Data Drain, we defeat the bug. After the fight, we wonder if the rumor on the board was false, so we go back to check. On the boards, we see a post in a previous thread that once talked about Scathe and Aura. Someone located a mysterious room. The field is protected now, and the previous player was able to remember the field's location before not being able to access it. So we hack the gate and enter the field. 
Making our way through the dungeon, we come across an empty white room with a small area dedicated to what appears to be a house in a forest. It has a white fence, the house made entirely of wood with trees surrounding the house, and a post with a leash attached to it with a food and water dish next to it. Suddenly, a voice calls out, Wave soars and shrouds the eyes. No means to fight an omnipresent force. The shadowless ones just grieve. Why must it be a wave? Divide. If it would just... Then retaliate we may. And then we receive the key item Epitaph 03, and we utter the name Harold. A message from Wise Man tells us that he has a new plan. Instead of running the jamming program on the area itself, we will now try to quarantine the area where we believe the wave exists. He goes on to say that he would like to talk about the plan in detail at the Net Slums. We head to the Net Slums to meet up and go over the plan. Wise Man, per his last email, he motions to Helba to assign everyone their roles in the operation. Leos is assigned to search for the cursed wave, while also monitoring CC Corp employees. Wise Man will be assigned to analyze the information from Leos. We are assigned to form a party that will fight the cursed wave itself during the operation. The remaining will quarantine the operation area from other areas. Wise Man mentions that we have yet to specify the location, but will commence as soon as the information has become available. Until then, be prepared to receive word from Wise Man for the start of the operation. The meeting concludes. Back in town, we run into Elk. He tells us that he hasn't been able to make any contact with Mia, and asks if we've seen her around, which sadly we tell him we have not either. Elk mentions how they promised to meet back up, so he continues to look for her. With sadness in his voice, he goes off to try and find her. We have received word from Wise Man. He has reports from both Leos and Helba. Leos mentioned that there was a new victim, and judging from the cover-up activity unit, it verifies that this is a real coma case. Helba notices the increase in data volume building up in a certain field. Wise Man concludes that we should meet back up in the slums for Operation Breakwater. Black Rose also messages us, asking if we've read Wise Man's notes, and asks to accompany on the mission. Making it to the net slums, we prepare for the upcoming next wave. Everyone rallies together, and Helba assures us that we have nothing to worry about. Wise Man calls out, then Helba, Leos, Balmung, finally Black Rose. They all wish for us to initiate the plan. We begin going over the mission plan that this operation is to find the clue to restore the world and help the comatose victims. That wise man chose the name of the operation in hopes that, like the jetties on the beach, we can nullify the powerful force of a wave by working together. We then ask for everyone to lend a hand in this operation. Wise man starts by saying that he too would like to see Orca again. Balmung says the wielder of the bracelet shall commence the operation. Black Rose hypes up, saying, Show us what you got! We announce the commencement of Operation Breakwater. May the grace of the Twilight Dragon be with us. Altogether, everyone in the net slum agrees. Helba asks that we leave the quarantine to her, so we may focus on the fight. Reviewing the field, this time it's the same field that we went to at the beginning of the game. However, the level of the field has gone up from level 52 to level 69. We make it into the field and down to the boss room. Helbo contacts us to inform us that the area will now be in quarantine, and all communications from here on out will be offline. We are now faced with Phase 5, Gore, the Machinator. Two giant stone faces with unique markings on their backsides. Black Rose is freaked out by their designs. The two faces of Gore have different tolerances. One has a physical tolerance, while the other has a magical tolerance. Their movesets consist of Earthquake, Slow, Charm, Creeping Murder, which does an instant KO to a single party member, while severely damaging everyone else, Blade of Scheme, which has both sides of Gore spiral around a target, causing a fiery tornado, Flare of Conspiracy, the two heads converse with one another, then single out a single party member, and each fire beams of energy that combine and explode. And lastly, Data Drain, which causes all debuffs onto a single target of its choosing. Once weakened enough, you may use Data Drain, reducing them down to their stone form. Its stone form also has its own movesets that include Earthquake and Sleep. With Gore's defeat, it cries out, No! I can't, I can't, I can't! How? before crumbling to pieces. Leos and Helba arrive. Leos mentions how all appears to have gone well. However, an investigation will still be needed, but it appears we have succeeded for now. Balmung puts his hand on our shoulder and says we should rejoice in our triumph. Black Rose speaks to herself, saying, Kazu, 
Hold on, we're nearly there. Suddenly, Helba gets a signal from the Theta server. A massive amount of fluctuating data has been detected. There is a possibility that the curse wave is moving. Wiseman points out that it is running, how this is the beginning of a counterattack. But we don't believe that this is a counterattack, but rather that this is the true rule of the game Harold created. After defeating Gore, we receive an email from Bandai, and we get a location to a super boss. But before we handle that, we go to a dungeon where we meet up with A20. She was told the dungeon had a golden grunty item, but was only able to get a crystal grunty item. It isn't what she's looking for, so she gives us the item. We ask if it's alright for us to receive it, and she confirms that she is only interested in the golden grunty, and decides to give us another item, and hands us a set of grunty food. We ask why she is so interested in the golden grunty and she can't really find an answer as to why she's just collecting them and hasn't thought about what to do with them we say our goodbyes and she gates out exploring the dungeon we run into elk we ask what he is doing here and tells us that he was looking for mia then abruptly we hear something behind us we fight and defeat the monster afterwards we hear someone else in the room and it turns out to be bear from dot hack sign he compliments us on the job well done in the fight we confuse him for our friend Orca, but he tells us that he isn't that famous, and introduces himself. He tells us that he likes to support new players to the game, however, we don't seem to need any help. He takes one look at Elk, and also mistakes Elk for someone he knows, an old comrade, that being Tsukasa. He decides to give us his weapon, for he thinks it might be useful. We say our goodbyes, and says that perhaps we may run into each other again. Elk mentions that he wasn't able to find Mia, and decides to look elsewhere. Now we head to the field given to us from Bandai. We make it to the boss room. The boss is like a Cerberus. We believe we have found the cause of the infection in the area. The monster is called Black Death and has a magic tolerance. It has a flame breath that will either KO or nearly KO a party member. Its normal attacks also have the effect Death, which can add additional damage, which may also cause an instant KO. It can also hit three times, taking chunks of your health if you don't heal fast enough. This monster is crazy strong, and if you fight it normally, it will be quite taxing on your revival items, and may not give you a chance to data drain it. In order to defeat it, you'll need to use the item Beast Bane. This will remove its magical tolerance, which will allow for any type of attack to hurt it, which will let you deal enough damage to break it down for data drain. Data draining it will give you the rare dual blade weapon Golden Yasha. After its defeat we proclaim to have defeated the root of the infection in the area so it should be fine now. If you've made it to the end of the video I would like to say thank you for watching and if you'd like me to cover any other game leave it down in the comments below and I may cover it in another video. But until then I hope you have a great rest of your day.